Well, let's continue the conversations about the lockdown. I know some of you are saying, oh, goodness me, can we not keep talking about this? I'm sorry, guys. This is our health. This is our economy. This is the future of our country. Uh, this really does matter. Let's talk to Sir Desmond Swain. He's a former international development minister, conservative MP, and uh, something of a lockdown sceptic. Sir Desmond Swain, it does appear uh, that many in the uh, government are not. Uh, the prime minister wouldn't yesterday rule out a full national lockdown when only a few weeks ago he was saying he wouldn't do it. Um, now we're looking at Manchester, Link Lancashire, moving from tier two to tier three. London probably moving to tier two being announced later today. I mean, goodness me, um, we, we do seem to be heading headlong into a second national lockdown, don't we? Well, it is very frustrating, but we've just got to, as Burko used to say, persist, <laughs> keep making the argument. We are winning our lives. Um, the Chancellor is certainly appears to be on our side. Uh, the World Health Organization has even spoken out now and said that countries shouldn't use uh, lockdowns as their primary means of controlling uh, the virus. But we've still got this. You know, at least the prime minister has resisted thus far the, uh, the temptation, uh, the invitation even of SAGE for another uh, national lockdown. Uh, and, and let's, let's just be clear about SAGE. The scientists will answer the question scientifically that you ask them. Yeah. And we are asking them, what is the best way of restraining the spread of the virus until we get a vaccine? And given that the virus spreads by human contact, they're coming back with the rather obvious scientific answer, stop all human <laughs> contact. Of course, that advice comes with the caveat that this will have other costs that it's not in our remit to discuss. Economy, yeah. mental uh, health. They do health note things. in their advice, we saw those minutes the other day, they do note those extra costs, but they're not their responsibility. Their job is to, as you say, answer the question, how do we prevent as many COVID deaths as possible? And you say, it's a very simple answer if you're not worried about the the fallout. It's very clear, as you mentioned, the Chancellor Rishi Sunak, he's the front page of the Telegraph today. He's been talking about how we have an economic emergency and that a, a second national lockdown would be a blunt instrument uh, that would cause needless damage to low uh, uh, low uh, infection areas like the South West, but again, also huge parts of London. Nine and a half million people living in London, large parts of London not experiencing any increase in infection rates, uh, and yet uh, a few small parts are. But we're talking about the, I mean, this is bearing around the powerhouse of the national economy, and one third of all tax paid in this country, one third of all the money the Treasury gets is from London. Talking about effectively locking down London. That would be economic insanity, wouldn't it? Well, it would, uh, and it's, uh, it would be disastrous. And that is exactly what the point that is made on the front page of the, uh, the uh, sage advice. It's for you to make those decisions. It's for politicians to consider the other costs and, in my view, come up, come up with the, you know, the clear conclusion that what they propose is worse than the disease itself and there are better ways of managing the spread. I mean, it, it just strikes me as so blindingly obvious uh, as to be ridiculous. Okay. And the argument that seems to be given from a lot of politicians in favour of these measures is, well, these measures are happening all across Europe and they're going into things like curfews, rule of six. Uh, Macron announced for nine cities, including Paris, uh, there's 9pm curfew, even people going to each other's houses and the like. And so they're doing these measures. So obviously these are the right measures. But the argument, I think, is the other way around. And I wonder what you think about this, which is that all of these countries have had completely different uh, handling of the pandemic. Very, very strict lockdown in Spain, uh, much less of a lockdown than some other countries. Germany, fantastic test and trace system. Uh, France, it's obviously absolutely completely useless test and trace system. All very different figures, all done different things. Um, and yet they're all they're all now facing an increase in the virus, as anyone sane would have predicted in the autumn anyway. Um, does that not suggest that all of these measures that governments take actually don't have very much effect. And we've all ended up with pretty much exactly the same pattern of disease, uh, of, of infection rates going up exponentially uh, in March and April and then going down in a slow, benefit, slow move and then slightly going up in the autumn, as we would expect. And that actually all of this intervention that costs billions of pounds doesn't make a blind bit of difference. I'm afraid you're right. And it's one of those it's one of those primary examples of, of what we now call groupthink. There is safety in numbers. 
Everyone else is doing it. We better not step out of line because if it goes wrong, then we will be, all the opprobrium will fall on us. But one of the things that has really annoyed me recently is the way that one or two members of SAGE, notwithstanding that advice on the front page, you know, all the costs of this are for you to compute, are stepping out and saying, actually, the government ignored us and we've run out of time. We should have done this two weeks ago. It's outrageous for people to say that. They weren't ignored. They were listened to and disagreed with. That is a clean, different thing. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. We're constantly being told, listen to the science. But the whole point is that it is up to the politicians who are elected by us to make decisions. And we're, we seem to get the impression now that it is just the Chancellor, um, I think probably some of the business ministers as well, standing between us and the second lockdown. I, I've kind of got no doubt now that the Prime Minister will give in and there will be a, a second lockdown. And I think part of this is down to the fact that we are now being led by opinion polls. 68%, according to a YouGov poll, say they would support a two-week, what well, they call it a national circuit breaker. Um, we put this question to various other guests this morning as well. Um, I wonder if you think that actually um, we're not quite asking the, the right questions. And if people knew the full costs and what what a what a so-called circuit breaker might actually mean in terms of the length of time of a, a national lockdown, the economic costs, uh, the, the cost of the NHS and the, the basically the fact that all it would do is realistically just push deaths along a few more months, um, that actually people wouldn't be in support of it. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm straining to find this 64%, even among government ministers. They all come up to me in the division lobby and say, Desmond, you're quite right. <laughs> and they're members of the government. Yeah. Um, you know, never mind. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm just straining to find all these people, this 64%, who believe this. It would be a disaster and people are not being told. And they are being frightened to death. Um, by the chief scientists and their predictions and their uh, tale of woe. Um, I think that that's part of it. But I, still, even then, I strain to find the 64%. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I don't meet these people. I don't know who they are. Thank you very much indeed, Sir Desmond Swain, uh, Conservative MP, former minister.